Good morning, good morning, and welcome to the Stitched by Susan channel. I'm Susan Smith. You're in my studio, Stitched by Susan. And today, rather than our typical quilting, we're actually going to be binding a quilt. So for those of you who are new, most often my live and unscripted shows are kind of a reality show of long arm quilting a project. From beginning to end, it's in real time, it's streamed exactly live, so thread breaks, needle breaks, oopses and all, you get to see it all. And kind of the reasoning for these live and unscripted episodes is that it can be difficult sometimes to learn if you don't have someone to work alongside. And of course, that's particularly difficult with the long arm because you pretty much never work alongside somebody. So I just wanted to give you all a chance to kind of come into my studio and watch over my shoulder and see how I do it. So today is going to be similar in style. I'm taking the quilt that I quilted Crazy Eights on in the last Live and Unscripted two weeks ago, and I'm going to put the binding on it. Now, I most often machine bind my quilts because it's fast is my number one reason. Also, it's very durable, and I've done enough of them and kind of worked out my methods so that I can make it look sharp. Sharp looking details matter to me, and so um, some people avoid machine bindings because they think they look less than, that less care went into them. They don't look as good as a hand stitched binding. So I want to give you options. I want to show you today how I do my machine bound ones and how good they can look. So before we launch into that, um, a few things. If you're just tuning in fresh today, I invite you to give a thumbs up to my channel and even to subscribe. That way you'll get notifications. Um, I think you have to click on the bell too to get notifications whenever new episodes come up. Uh, pretty much always they're this casual flow of consciousness while I'm working and I'm just talking through my processes. And those of you who are here live can ask questions in the chat window and I'm happy to answer them while I'm working. If you're watching later in a replay, you can still type in questions and I make every effort to come back and answer every single one. So bring on your questions. What else, Dave, have we not talked about? Um, I should mention my producer is my husband, Dave. He's behind the scenes. I don't think he's got a camera tuned on him this morning. Oh, he oh he does. <laughs> Look at that. There's Mr. Producer, without whom this would not be possible, for sure. And also our good friend Dan, who's the guitarist whose music you hear in all these episodes, and he allows us to use that music, and it's so beautiful, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. And what else? I guess that's about it. Um, I don't have to introduce my long arm machine today because I'm not actually using her, so... Today you get a kind of bonus of getting to see the opposite side of my studio. The long arm is kind of in front of me there and that's the side of the room that you usually see in these episodes. So today you're getting to see another corner of it. So welcome. let's get to work. Welcome. Let's welcome all our folks in this morning. Let's see who we've got. Sue. And you know, Sue, you've watched quite a few episodes and Dave noticed right away that you changed your profile picture. So see, we're getting acquainted. <laughs> Good morning from hot and sunny Bancroft. Laura from Kansas. Pat from Vermont, Jana Bowman, Jana's my pretty much next door neighbor, she attends often, Christy from Maryland, and Mickey from the North Georgia Mountains, good to see you again Mickey, Jill from Minnesota, Jana's in Suncrest, Washington, yes, just not very far from me really. Paula, first time to see live on vacation in Panama City Beach, Florida, I'm honored that you would spend a little vacation time with me, honestly. Um, Jill, I was so inspired by your crazy eights pattern that I tried it on a charity quilt. It turned out great. I'll definitely do it again. I'm so glad. It it looks a bit intimidating, doesn't it? You kind of wonder how in the world does that come out so good. But when it's overall and you look at the whole quilt, it is just an awesome texture. Glad you tried it. Uh, where are we at? Arlene, good morning from Spokane Valley. And Darlene from Montana City. And Sue D from Lincoln, Nebraska. Candace from Texas. Yep. Good. We are well represented over the country here. Okay, let's get going and we'll check back in with hellos from time to time. So are they able to see the quilt on the floor, Dave? Do you have a camera that gives that shot? Okay, I'm going to lift it up then. Here's the quilt that we're working on. And it's smallish square. It's about 63 inches square. I'm just going to fling it over my chair for now. And you're getting to see on the wall behind me um, another of the the same design. So the one we're doing today, the cinnamon colored one, was my first prototype when I was designing this pattern and, you know, figuring out all the wrinkles in it. 
And then the blue and green and, and haze one, it's not really white, it's a gray, is the one that was featured in the Quilt Maker magazine in the May-June issue. Uh, sorry, not Quilt Maker, I said that wrong, McCall's. Oh, and Linda's chiming in from Norwich, UK. Fantastic. And Karen, 6 p.m. in South Africa. Husband is cooking steak whilst I watch. How nice. Thanks for joining, Karen. Okay, so as promised, we're going to do this from start to finish so that you get to see all the steps. And I think, I hope, you might find a few tips and tricks in here that maybe you haven't seen before that will help you. Someone messaged me this morning um, when I was posting about this episode and she said, you know, you must have read my mind. I've been wanting to learn how to do machine binding. My miters are terrible. It looks sloppy. And I'm like, tune in because I think I have some tips that can just help you sharpen up those little details. So we're going to start right from cutting. So here we are at the cutting board. This is the same cinnamon colored solid that is actually in my quilt and it is by Paintbrush Studio. I love, 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 love their solids. So I cut my bindings at two and a quarter inches, but my method works the same no matter what size you cut. I'll mention those measurements a few times throughout where you will need to make adjustments. But if you wonder what I'm doing, I'm cutting at two and a quarter inches. And just a side note here, I know a lot of quilt makers will tell you, don't use the measurements on your mat for cutting, only use a ruler. I personally use my mat measurements all the time. I figure why else are they there? So if you think it looks like I'm cutting backwards, because usually your ruler is extended over the bit that's not yet cut, that's why. So that's a matter of personal preference. So I cut my strips at two and a quarter inches. I measured my quilt and while I cut, I'll tell you these calculations, how I determine how much binding I need. So I measured the perimeter of my quilt. It is 63 inches on each side, and I now can't remember the number, of course, because I did it last night. And my phone is being used as a camera, so I can't demonstrate for you. But what I did is I took the 63 plus 63 plus 63 plus 63, or times four, because it's a square quilt. Got that number, that's the perimeter, right? Added 10 inches to give me excess for mitering the corners. Okay, so took that whole number and divided it by 42 because I know I have 42 usable inches in my fabric in each strip. So if your fabric, you know, you might want to go with 40 to be on the ultra safe side because some fabrics don't actually have 42, but many do. So know your fabric, but in this case, I know that I have 42. In any event, my whole measurement, so perimeter plus 10 inches equals divided by the 42 usable inches per strip came to 6.24, right? So six and a quarter strips is what I needed. So I will obviously cut seven. So one, two, three, four. Five. Six. and seven. So that's it for cutting. We'll just tuck that out of the way. The next step then is to sew them all together. Just get our little cutting utensils out of the way. Actually, I'm gonna put them clean away so that I have plenty of room when I come back to pressing. All right. So I'm going to sew these all together using a, <coughs> I'm not sure if the correct term is a mitered seam, but at least a slanted seam at a 45 degree angle. And the reason for that is, let's have a good close up look here, Dave, if we could. Yep, that's fine. If I were to sew my fabrics together straight like this, open the seam up, and then I have all these folds that go around the quilt, which way, this way? This way? On this side? No, nope, just over further? Okay. Picture in your mind that the number of fabric folds that are now formed here, this is very bulky and makes a real lump in the binding. Whereas, if we do a slanted seam 
that seam is dispersed across a whole bunch of space and therefore does not double up in the folds. So I think this is fairly critical. Now here, as with my long arm quilting, I do a lot of things by guess and by gosh, just because I've done a lot of sewing. You might want to take the time to mark where you want to sew for this seam. But for me, I just lay my pieces at 90 degree angles across each other and I sew from one corner to the other corner and I do it by eye. But if you want to mark, be my guest. It might be worth it. If you're having, you know, not very successful bindings, probably really worth it to start. Um, I think you can see I've got this blue piece of painter's tape stuck on my machine and it is exactly aligned with my needle. So this part I don't know that you can see, but where my fabrics cross over, this little cross right here at the front, as long as I keep that lined up on my blue tape, I've got a straight seam going right under my needle and I use that for all kinds of angled seams. It's just one way to save marking for me. I don't bother breaking thread, I just go ahead and sew them all one after another. And I've got a fairly short stitch. On my machine it's 2.5, which would be 2.5 millimeters. Some machines have different units of measurement, but it's fairly short. because I am working with a solid, which looks the same on both sides, I do have to take care that I always have the same side up. In other words, that all my seams will be facing one direction. So this is super simple, but it really makes a lot less bulk wherever the joins are in your binding, this is definitely worth doing. Most cutting mats will have 45 degree angled lines on them. So if you prefer to mark your sewing line, that's an easy way to do it. Just line up your fabric with the horizontal marking lines on your mat Put your ruler on one of those 45 degree angle lines and there you've got a nice sewing line. So I'd like to hear from you in the comments when I get to these kind of slow bits. Um, and I'm busy sewing and don't have much to say. I'd love to hear how you're maybe filling in the last days of summer, or if perhaps you're watching from the other side of the world, the last days of winter. All right, so that done, I'm just going to cut apart all my seams and I might as well do my trimming while I'm here, which I will need a scissors for. So I will show you this where you can see it well on the camera. So basically, I want to have a quarter inch seam trimmed and in order to get rid of all the little dog ears I just follow the edge of this fabric then trim my quarter inch seam and then trim this little ear off just like that and then when we go and press this open we're going to have a nice flat seam so I just do that with each one and we have seven strips so we shall have six seams You certainly could do this with your rotary cutter. I think it takes longer to get things set up and laying flat. And none of these seams will show, none of the seam allowances, so it doesn't matter if they're cut perfectly straight or not. You're just trying to get rid of the bulk of the fabric. Okay, there are all those little bits done. One thread tail. Okay, and now we're going to head and press all of this. 
into binding. And if there are some comments, go ahead and put them up now. I forgot to turn the iron on earlier, so we're going to have to give that just a minute to warm up. Time for a sip of coffee and to look at some comments. Sue, it doesn't work as well if you sew across the other angle. You're right, Sue. I didn't think of mentioning that, that um, it just fits under your sewing machine presser foot better and more conveniently to use this particular angle. In terms of how it appears on the final quilt, it doesn't matter which angle you use. It's just for convenience. Karen, I can't tell you how many times I do not get my seams in the right direction as I land up stitching when I flip the binding strip. Harder with plain fabric. It is harder with plain fabric. So, you know, maybe, maybe there's a way you could put a sticky note of paper or a pin marking all those right sides so you're sure to get right sides together when you're stitching. Probably less time to do that than to redo. Jill, I sew my binding together exactly the same way with blue painter's tape and chain piecing. Love it. Yep. You guys know I love my painter's tape. Paula, I press first and then trim. That way I don't burn my fingers and I get a nice flat seam. Fair enough. I'm curious if you press to one side. You're going to see that I choose to press open because it's another way to reduce a bit of that bulk wherever the seam folds over on itself. Sue, finally getting my mojo back after moving and catching up on FPP blocks of the Orophil Endangered Species Project. Glad you got your mojo back. Okay, the iron should be hot. Now you could do this one of two ways. You could press start folding it in half and press the seams as you come to them. But I'm going to show you my favorite tip for folding it in half. So I choose to press all my seams first and I do press them open just because I think it makes less bulk. Mr. Producer is telling me don't lean forward so far because I'm right under the camera. So I'll try and keep that in mind. Sorry, you guys, if you get views of the top of my head. Or worse yet, down my shirt. <laughs> and I'm taking just a second to flatten the fold that was in the fabric, the middle fold. And you'll see why that comes in handy when you see my little tip for folding the binding as well. I want it as long and smooth as I can possibly manage. And I'm a lover of steam, so I'm just giving a little zap of steam to each of these areas, too. My iron, by the way, is an ultra simple department store variety, Shark. I love Sharks for their really good steam. And if you happen to want the same one that I've got, I do have a link to it on my website on my little resources page. It's not a big iron not a professional one it's just a gooder okay here comes my tip for doing the binding can you see this pin right here this is a like a corsage pin it's just a sturdy any sturdy pin will do but it will need to be sturdier than your typical piecing pin so this is two inches long and it's a tough one so I just take a little stitch in my ironing board surface and then I'm going to take another go down into that surface but I want it to be the exact same width as my binding fold so this is where if you do a different size of binding it will be a little different from mine and there's no right or wrong so I'm going to slide that binding under the pin and go across it with my pin and then force my pin back down into the ironing board fairly tight against it and I'm going to make it a little tighter without the fabric in there you'll see how slick this works in just a minute this is a poor man's tool so get your little fold under the pin, like so. And we're going to keep the iron basically on the left side of it. And actually that feels kind of awkward to me, so I think I'm going to flip sides. And maybe it will help me keep my head out of the camera more too. Yeah, this will be better. <laughs> okay, we'll get this figured out. It never goes as smoothly when you're on camera. It just doesn't. It's worth the time it takes to set this up, though, I promise you. 
All right, let's see if that works. So now I'm able to just pull my fabric through. Can you see that? And it is folding it in half for me. And I'm having to kind of swap hands just because of the way I am on camera. Usually I do it the other way. I'm literally pulling out this side and pressing as it comes out. But still, it is a huge time saver. Let me see if I can work my arms the other way. Nope, I can't. <laughs> so there's funny little things that happen here. This doesn't work necessarily well with every fabric or every binding. Can you see here I'm getting this little balled up bit of a thread that's coming off? And I notice that with this particular line of solids, that happens. Some fabrics do not fray nearly as badly, and so they work more easily. So there is the odd time that I just decide it's not worth the fuss, but this 90% of the time, this is my go-to for folding my binding. Seriously, it does not want to work well when I'm on camera. It just doesn't. Back up a little, get it in there more smoothly. There we go. Because I should be able to pull with one hand and press with the other. That's my goal. These solids, what I like about them is that they have a kind of soft hand and that is what's working against me now is they're not, it's not really crisp. So I have not experimented, but maybe one of you would like to. If I had starched it a little first, even my long strip, um, done some kind of pressing agent on it, this might actually be going better. I'm not going to take the time to do, move that this morning or to change that. But I think I am going to go back to regular pressing just because this is actually taking longer. So maybe we should add that in there for a tip. You know, know your fabric, know your process, and switch it up if you need to. This does give me an opportunity to share one other tip though. One of my favorite tools is my ironing table. Now you're not seeing the whole thing, but you're getting the gist of it. It is, it is rectangular, so it has straight edges and square corners. So for binding purposes, for example, I can start way off on the far right edge. You, I think they can see it well enough, Dave. I can literally run this across the front of my board. Um, you know how it can distort if you're working on a curved ironing board? Because I've got this straight line right in front of me, I can keep my binding really nice and straight and it has no funky curves in it. So that's another possible tool. And I gotta say my square ironing board is one of my favorites because making quilts, I'm always working with straight lines straight seams, square blocks, and it just helps that little bit to be able to eyeball things to get them straight. Well, I'm sorry my handy tip for the pin didn't work super well. I do know I have another Live and Unscripted episode with the binding on the sundress quilt, and I used the pin on there and it worked better. That was a more crisp fabric. So for this one, I feel like the fastest way is to just do long straight stretches with my fingers and it's working. And I do find it helpful for getting an accurate, um, consistent width of finished binding. It's important that I had this cut straight and it's important that I press it in half now. You know, if, you're, if your fold is an eighth of an inch off here and an eighth of an inch off there, you're going to end up with binding that's a little wider here and a little narrower there, right? That only makes sense. So the more accurate you can be with the cutting and the, the pressing, the better result you're going to get. And that is completely your own benchmark, however precise you want to be. I do like things to be quite neat and trim. So I love to press it just so.
And I know you're getting pictures of my head all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't think of all the things. I just can't. But we're almost to the end of pressing. Okay, we have a few comments. And while we're reading the comments, I'm going to be winding this. Oh, where's the camera? There we are. Over my hand, just like this. And then I'll show you how I keep the thing from tangling. If that twists it terribly when you're doing this, if you have a really long binding, then you might want to roll it this way so that it's not a twist every time you go over your hand. Make sense? And if you try it, you'll see what I mean. If you have a really long binding and you're doing a twist, every time you go over your hand, you're going to get a tangled mess. Today's is not very long, and so I'm going to be able to do that and just let the twists fall out the bottom. Okay, some comments while I wind? Paula, I press first and then trim. Mm -hmm. And I asked about a flat seam. Oh, and you do it open, Paula. Okay, so you must just trim each side of it. Absolutely an option. Sure. Sue, I actually meant sewing across them the wrong way if you sew between the strips instead of across the strips. Ah, yes, got it. Good comment, good note. Jana, do you use steam with all your seams? Pretty much I do. I am a steamer. Arlene, I've used a similar method but not, but used two pins spaced a bit wider than my iron. Place the iron down on the board between the two pins and gentle pull the strip through. That's a good idea, Arlene. That would be a different kind of configuration of pins um, and might really help. Yeah, yeah, good idea. And Deb is chiming in from Tallahassee. Fantastic. Almost done. Almost done. And you can see this solid, this brand of solids does fray a bit. It's going to get all enclosed in the seam allowance. I'm not panicking too much, but it's another reason that this one is not the best candidate for pulling through pins because that obviously really accentuates the fraying going on. Okay, after I get it wound up like so, here's what I do. And I just keep an extra thread cone in the bottom drawer of my sewing machine and I drop the binding over it. Okay, so when I go to sew now, you won't be able to see this, so I'm just going to explain it to you. I'm going to be working with this end of the binding, attaching it to my quilt, and I'm going to have this pressed between my knees, basically. And so this is just going to unwind as I sew. Presto, no tangle. That tip is not original to me. I cannot remember what quilter I first heard it from, but it works fabulously. Okay, we have another question. Paula, do you ever apply binding while the quilt is still on the long arm? I have done that, Paula, and I still do for clients. It tends to be when it's a really big quilt, you know, or one that would be hard to manhandle at the sewing machine. The thing with that is you have to apply the binding to the front, and then the client goes home and hand stitches it on the back. So when I'm doing my own 100% machine bindings, as you'll see in a minute, I'm going to apply my binding to the bottom side of the quilt, fold it round and top stitch on the front. So for my own quilts, I usually do them at my domestic machine. So here we go. Here's our quilt. And as I just said, we're going to actually sew the binding on the back. So you're going to get to see the backing of it for the most part. And I also have, um, can you see them? I'm pointing the wrong direction, this direction. I have little tags that I put in my quilts that are 100% my own. So I'm just going to take a moment to get that ready and pinned in place because you would not believe how many times I have forgotten to put a tag in and then felt like I should redo the binding or parts of it. So they're very simple tags. They just say stitched by Susan on one half and on the bottom half they say wash warm, dry low. So that when I give quilts away, there's some really basic instructions there for the new owner. So I'm just going to pin that in place right off the bat. Now, when we sew, this is another thing that will be determined by how wide you cut your binding. So in my case, I cut a two and a quarter, and so I've got a seam allowance set that is just under a third. Are we looking at my machine here? It's under a third of this width 
because I'm going to have seam allowance and then I'm going to fold over this side and fold over the other side and I want my top stitching to fall on the quilt side of the binding. Does that make sense? And it will make more as we go along and you see it. So whatever you've cut this width, you want your stitching line now to be a little under a third of it. So because I've done a bunch, I've figured that out on my machine and I've already got it set at the place where I know it's suitable for my binding. If you don't know, then I suggest you sew just six inches or so, take it off your machine and break thread, fold it around and see how the fit falls into place and make an adjustment if necessary. Where's my presser foot? There it is. Okay, here we go. Now I'm going to put a slightly longer stitch length on here. We don't have to have a tiny one for this. So I've got a three on right now. And there my tag is sewn in so I can pull the pins out. I know I'm a naughty girl and sew over pins, but I have fine pins and I do it all the time. Knock on wood. So here's one of my little tricks for getting neat corners. Again, this came from a quilting friend, not my own tip. Can you see that I'm snipping off just a little bit of the angle? Let me just make sure here. I don't want all the layers. I just want the batting and the backing. And I'm just snipping off this little corner. All that does is reduces a little bit of bulk in the corner. You don't want to schwack the whole thing off because you'll feel that. Um, and it'll feel like an empty corner. But if you don't do any trimming, that corner can be over full and really knobby feeling. So give that a try. Okay, we're stitching along again. And here's the first critical thing in mitering a corner. I need to know exactly what this width is and I need to stop exactly that distance from the end. So from this end of my quilt that I'm stitching toward now, I wanna stop that same seam allowance width from that end, okay? So eyeball it or better yet, tuck a pin in it. Okay, so you know exactly where to stop stitching. Just like the Bolt movie, put a pin in it. So I'm gonna stop stitching right at that pin, okay? You can either break thread right there or what I choose to do, because I think it's a little stronger as I angle my quilt and I just stitch right off the edge. Couple, three stitches, break thread. And I have a cheater machine that cuts the threads for me. Okay, step number two in making a square corner. Fold your binding back and it should fold right against that stitching line. It should be 45 degrees in from the corner, right? Because you've got a seam allowance here and seam allowance here and right at that point is where you stop stitching. This is what's critical. Don't let the binding veer off to the right or veer off to the left. You want a 90 degree angle right here with that binding, okay? I put another pin in it. Now this pin is lined up right with the edge of that quilt because I'm gonna fold the binding back and I want that fold to be right on the edge. Later on, you'll see me just doing it with my fingernail because again, I'm a corner cutter. But this is how you know that it's right. Put a pin in it. I can't get that pin in straight for anything. There we go. So my pin is right lined up with the edge of the quilt and you'll get a chance to see this four times so don't panic too much. Fold the binding back and now you should see the fold should be right along this edge. The new raw edge here should line up with this edge of the quilt and this here both folds should be right lined up together. That's telling you you've got a square corner and all your folds here are perfectly square. Hold that all in place, pin it in place if you need to and pivot your quilt. And now I start stitching right on the edge of the quilt again. Like no need to go in the seam allowance distance. Get my needle dropped in order to hold that in place. And now, I, you guys probably can't see this on camera. Maybe you want to put the one, the big camera on, Dave, so they can. This is what I call my faux table extension. I have a drawer on the side of my machine, which I pull open and use it as something on which to rest my quilt. I think it's really critical that you 
that your quilt is not pulling and you're not trying to manhandle it when you're trying to sew these accurate corners, right? So you need that weight to be taken up by something else. And if you take time to rearrange it so that the area where you're sewing flows freely and you're not having to reach to get it under there, you'll have far better success. So take that little bit of time to rearrange the quilt top whenever you need to so that this can flow smoothly and without resistance. And then we're just going to start stitching again. So you guys are seeing one of my favorite tools, my trusty seam ripper. I recently did a Pinterest idea pin for all the ways to use a seam ripper besides ripping, but this is one of them. It's like a stylus basically. So you don't need another tool for a stylus necessarily. So you can guide, you can press and guide your fabric right under the foot without risk of, you know, sewing your finger in or anything like that. So I used it to start this seam because it was kind of thick and it didn't really want to grab and feed through. So I just put some pressure with my seam ripper end under there and away it goes. And I use that frequently when I'm sewing on bindings because another hurdle that you will often run into is that your the top fold of your binding wants to push forward as you're stitching and then your edges come out of alignment and you end up with this excess fabric at the top. What do you do with that? Well, the trick is use your seam ripper to cause it to feed evenly. Another tip, of course, could be to use a walking foot and lots of people do that to apply their binding. Personally, I'm too lazy to change feet. I just use my trusty little seam ripper stylus. But that might be something you want to try if that's something that's giving you grief. Try a walking foot because that will feed it top and bottom at the same pace. That's the whole purpose of a walking foot. And one last tip before we just dive into sewing for a few minutes. Maybe Dave will turn the music on then while I sew. But here's my last tip. So frequently you'll see a quilt that has wavy edges after the binding is all completed. If you lay the thing flat on the floor, the edges are a little bit ripply. Here's the way to fix it. Put a little bit of tension on this binding as you're stitching it. So it's just a wee bit tighter, a wee bit less excess. And that's it. And then I just stitch, stitch, stitch till I get to the other end. really try to keep the quilt down flat so you can see. How much tension I put on that binding as I'm sewing sometimes will depend on the quilting. If the quilting is quite dense or really pulling up like horizontal lines that all run in the same direction and then that kind of pulls the quilt together, then I would really put some tension on that binding so that it's equally pulled up, if that makes sense. Because I don't want to have more binding than I have quilt when the quilt has relaxed and laid flat. And that just comes with experimenting, I think, knowing how much to do that.
brushing the corners, I'm going to take a moment again to trim just a little slanted bit out of my backing and batting. Just reducing the bulk of that corner just a little. You can see how tiny that is. It's not very much. And I'll go ahead and put a pin in to mark my stopping point for my stitching as well. It's easier to do when it's not quite so far under the needle as I did it last time. Slow down until I get right to that pin. Zip off the corner. And cut the thread. So once again, we're going to miter this corner. Let me put my scissors away so you can see better. So I'll show you this so you can see what I've done. I've stitched to my stopping point that I marked and then just a couple stitches off the edge. Open that corner the first time, again making really sure that this line is straight. Okay, I don't want to, can you see it really nice and straight there? The way I was was better. I don't want to be veering any to the left or to the right. I want this line to be beautifully straight. I'm going to use my fingernail this time. I've just put it down right at the edge, fold it back snugly, and now I'm taking a visual check. Does this fold line up perfectly here? Does this raw edge line up perfectly here? Does my, do my folds here fall evenly, showing that I've got a square 90 degree corner there and a nice miter? Here again stylus coming in handy. So I'm starting kind of on a thick area, right? So I'm just going to give it a little nudge, stitching slowly. There we go. And now I can feel the feed dogs grabbing and we're up and away. Now I'll take a second to rearrange the bulk of my quilt. What do you think of my backing? Are you getting a good view of it? It's all top hats and mustaches. I thought it was suitable for this kind of dapper quilt. An actually funny story that goes with this. I, intending to purchase the back for this quilt, I had bought some fabric off Etsy. And um, some of you may remember the line. I can't off the top of my head remember the designer, but it had foxes on it. And the foxes were all wearing bow ties. Lots of them were houndstooth plaid or check or stripes, just these Again, dapper little bow ties, and I thought, oh my word, that is so cute. So I ordered it for my backing, and the night before I was doing the live and unscripted episode, I was prepping all my things, you know, and I realized I had only bought one length of the fabric, not two. So, sadly, we couldn't put that cute one on here. But this is one I had in my stash, and it's pretty cute too. Pretty fitting. Dave's laughing at me that I had a stash fabric in my stash. So hopefully he's playing some nice music for you because essentially I'm just stitching all the way down the second side of the quilt now using my seam ripper stylus to keep the fabric feeding evenly, uh, putting a little bit of tension on my strip as I'm sewing it. I recommend, actually, if you're trying to get the hang of machine binding, I recommend that you do a couple of quilts back to back, preferably small ones so it doesn't take you forever. If you do two or three of them right in succession, this will start to fall into place and it will kind of fix in your memory all the things to be looking out for and the little details.
for those who are just chiming in. I call this episode Live and Unscripted. I do these the first and third Monday of every month and occasionally a bonus one on the fifth Monday, which is what today is. Usually they are long arm quilting a project from start to finish. But again, occasionally I slip in a different type of project, but pretty much always they are casual. They are in real time. Oopses are included. I just get, you just get to come into my studio and watch over my shoulder as I do a project and show you my method, which is never the only method, but it is the one I use and I, I give you my reasons for the things that I do. And some of you chime in with some really great ideas, so I get to learn a little too. I'm approaching the corner again. I've taken my little snip to reduce the bulk. I put my pin to mark my stitching line. Just a half a stitch further. It's worth taking that time to make sure that ending point is just right. That is probably the single most important factor in getting a crisp 45 degree miter corner is getting that stitching point ending in the right place because everything else is based off of that. the same length too. It's not longer, it's not shorter. If you make that fold too long, you're going to end up with excess when you go to turn the quilt at the mitered corner. If you make it too short, you'll end up with a roundish corner because there won't be enough fabric to form a crisp fold. You see what I mean? This is what I mean by having too much. And it doesn't take very much. Can you see that? If my fold extends over the edge of that quilt, it's going to be an awkward, awkward corner when I go to flip it and turn it and fold the other side. So that is a second really important part. Have just enough and not too much fabric there. Not too much, not too little. Bit like Goldilocks. Just right. I wanted to mention too, on our last Live and Unscripted, which was two weeks ago, and I was quilting this project, I had asked you all, I had mentioned that I was getting really close to YouTube's threshold of watch hours for being able to monetize my channel. And I had asked you all to just, you know, turn it on while you were sewing a little bit. And some of you must have, because I did get over that threshold. So I appreciate that. And if you enjoy these episodes, please give us a thumbs up, give us a subscribe, a bell. The bell ensures that you get notified whenever new episodes become available. And I like to try and go back as often as I can after we've uploaded um, and put timestamps in. So I will really try to do that for today and timestamps for the different things like cutting it out or mitering a corner or the final join so that if you want to come back and refer to it later you don't have to watch the whole thing to find stuff you can just follow those timestamps and know where they're located in the replay and if any of you were interested in doing that for me I'd be very grateful and find a way to do you a favor if you felt like watching a replay and giving me those timestamps because it does take time obviously to go and locate them all, the kind of critical moments. And if you are by chance interested in supporting the channel, we, we keep improving the channel and we can only do that with your support. So we have recently upgraded one of our cameras and our hub, which all the wires go through. And we appreciate that. And that has all come through buymeacoffee.com, which is a little website where you can make 
either a one-time contribution or you can sign up for a monthly contribution. The minimum amount is $5. So basically the price of a copy just helps us to keep bettering the product that we can give you. And I really hope you find this helpful. I get good feedback from lots of people, so I trust that it is helping quilters out there. It is enjoyable for me to get to share the things that I know. And as I mentioned earlier, often you folks chime in with things that I've never thought of before and really helpful tips. Isn't that what they call the hive mind? So it's a little like having a social sewing bee, you know? And I love that. little corner. Let's just mark the stopping point for our stitching. A little over a week ago, I was able to do a rather special virtual trunk show. Um, my aunt lives in a retirement home in Southern Ontario. And so I made arrangements with their activity director to do this little trunk show for the ladies there. And of course, because that is very um, Amish and Mennonite country, many, many, if not all of those ladies have been quilt makers over the years. And so I deliberately chose my topic as the various vintage quilts that I have um, finished, you know, whether, whether I acquired them as entire tops or sometimes parts of quilt tops or sometimes even just blocks that had never been made into a quilt. And so I featured a number of those finished products and projects and then talked about some that I still have underway, still in my closet waiting for some attention and that sort of thing. So it was a really fun trunk show. So that is now open to the public on my YouTube channel, if you're interested in viewing that. Um, if you like that topic, if you think perhaps if you're a member of a guild that might be interested in that topic, let me know, because I would love to do that trunk show again. Um, and you can get a good preview of it there. So if that's something your guild might be interested in, I'd love to chat with you about it. Okay, we are on side number four. Yahoo! And I don't know that you can see it in the camera, but as we go, you can probably see the quilt being joggled. That's always me just shifting the bulk of it so that I'm never pulling against resistance. I always want to keep what's going under the needle flowing smoothly. Because again, that's critical for accuracy, that you're not straining to try and get stitches in there. Otherwise, you won't have straight seams and an accurate seam allowance.
So I'm going to stop stitching uh, about 12 or 14 inches from my beginning stitching point. And don't need to do anything special. Just break the thread. So can you see here? Here's my beginning piece. And I actually don't think I said this, so I'm going to say it now. When I began, I left a tail unstitched. And I started stitching, oh, probably six or seven inches in so that this tail is now available to do my final join. And of course, because, because why not? We're going to end up having two seams almost on top of each other at the end, which you really can't control easily. I may be able to get rid of the one. Anyway, let's see how it goes here. We need a pair of scissors, like so. And we need a measuring utensil, like so. Ah, uh, this might be easier in the overhead camera, Dave. You guys let me know if this is not clear enough. It's a little further away, but it helps you get a bigger picture. So I'm just going to trim off a little bit of this selvage because I don't want it to appear in my seam. Get the whole thing laying flat. That's pretty important. So here's my beginning piece laid flat. Here's my ending piece also laid flat. Now here's the critical part. We're going to cut with an overlap of whatever the original width of our binding was. So remember I cut at two and a quarter inches. That's what I want this overlap to be. If you cut your binding at two and a half or three, that's what you would want it to be. I mean, one way certainly is to just take your binding and open it up and lay it on there and that's the right width. That to me feels more awkward, but it is a way of being sure that you've got the correct width. So I'm just going to set my little ruler and I'm just going to trim that. And because I'm putting a little bit of tension on this as I sew, I'm also cutting it a hair short. And by a hair, I mean about 16th of an inch short of that two, two and a quarter inches. So here's my excess binding which by the way is less than one strip, so we know I calculated correctly. And now, I'm going to open up my bottom binding like this, and then I'm going to open up my top right across it. Okay? It, it's going to be on a 45. I just wanted them to be able to see that angle for sure. Can you see this now? So this is right side up on this side. This one is right side down. And they've crossed each other. And I do take the time to pin this because I want to be sure that they are squared away on each other. Otherwise, I'll have a seam that runs at a funky angle, not a 45 degree angle. So I've pinned this corner, okay? And I'm going to pin this corner as well, right up here. And now my seam is going to run right across here. And you don't see this very often, honestly. I'm actually going to have one seam intersect the other because I was about an inch short of having enough binding with six strips. But it will be okay. So I put kind of a fold in the quilt where that is unsewn so that it makes this a little, um, I can manipulate it a little better under the machine. Right, so I'm able to get it all flat and again, take time to arrange the quilt, move the bulk until there's nothing pulling or wrenching on this. I'm also going to shorten up my stitch length again. My machine, of all the strange things, does not have a reverse stitch. It only has a lock in place stitch. And so my answer to that is to just do really short stitches for seams like this, where I don't want them to come undone at either end. And I'm just sewing straight across to my other point. And I'll show you what that looks like. Can you see that? So I just aimed from this point right to this point, 45 degree seam. Now what I do, just to be sure, because I'm like you, I've done it wrong a time or ten, I just open up my quilt and pull it. Can you see that? And now I've confirmed it's running in the right direction. There's no weird twists in it, right? So then I will go back, trim out that seam allowance. I have to move it a little bit so that I can 
C. I'm just trimming it down to a quarter of an inch. And I don't actually take it to the ironing board. I just open it and press it with my thumbnail. Or if you had a little pressing wheel, that would certainly work too. But I just do it with my thumbnail. Give it a good press. It stays open. Can you see what I'm doing? I'm trying to get under there. So it's now pressed open. Make sure that it stays flat in there and fold it up. And you can see that's going to lay beautifully flat. Now all that's left is to start stitching where I left off and keep stitching till I join up with my beginning stitches. Easy peasy. Using my little stylus because I do have a seam here and there's a little bit of excess wanting to push out in front of my presser foot. I won't let it do that. I'll keep it going smoothly under the under the needle. And I just overlap my stitching by perhaps half an inch. Do a couple close stitches to lock stitch it. And just like that, it's finished. So it's all in place. So next step, we can take some questions because I'm going to be pressing for a minute and stand up at the ironing board. Also, I need a sip of coffee rather badly. Are you guys finding this helpful? I do hope so. This to me, this is so wonderful to have this skill under your belt. Deb, can you share where you purchased the tags? Deb, I'll try and get back to you in the comments. I can't off the top of my head remember. It was an Etsy shop, but I'll try and find the name for you because I'll show you them a little bit more. They come in a sheet. She prints them on a sheet and I trimmed them apart and they're like a, a woven cloth with a paper backing and I just peel the cloth off the backing. And I don't know that, I don't know that they're high-end tags. They were just the best I could find at that moment. Okay, and here is the tag, speaking of it. So this is another, to me, very critical step. I take my iron and I fold my binding back and press it. Now I endeavor not to press the whole quilt because I don't want to flatten my quilting particularly, but I, there's a lot less fatigue in your hands trying to wrap this around if you get this pressed. And it really helps with getting a crisp result. So I'm trying to just kind of, can you see I've got my iron tilted up a little? I'm trying to just press that edge. It's not quite hot yet. It was still waking up. Yeah, let's answer a question or two while it uh, heats up better. Andrea, did you make your ironing table using a regular table? Um, no. I'm not sure how to show you. We'll post, we'll try and post some pictures. I'll try to. My husband actually made this for me. What's underneath here is two very standard nine cube cubicles, you know, storing cubicles, and they're just back to back facing each other. So he put a frame on the bottom and cast your wheels and the, that frame holds the two of them together. And then my ironing board top is just three quarter inch plywood. It's covered with like a heat resistant pad, one layer of batting and one layer of fabric. And it's just stapled on the bottom side because I change out the fabric from time to time when it gets all stained and yucky looking. Oh, more questions, but I can press now while we're doing them. Judy, perfect time for teaching. I have four quilts that I need to bind. See, that's a perfect way to learn, Judy. I encourage you just do them one right after the other and you'll have the hang of it in no time. And you'll sort of never forget. Then even if you don't do it for a couple months, when you come back to it, it'll be right there at your fingertips. How much? You can't really see. Can you see how nice that lays? And now it's gonna be easy to fold that around to the front and top stitch when I'm not fighting with making it turn that other angle. So I always do this quick press. You can't quite get into the corner, but as close as you're able. And I'm just using the edge of my iron to kind of push it over. But my iron is not flat down on the whole quilt. Although if you're a quilt ironer, and I know some that are, 
then it won't matter to you. But I'm not a quilt ironer. I want the fluffy. To Judy, when you're working on your first quilt, if you're not sure how much tension to put on that binding, sew one side and take it to your ironing board and press it like this and kind of shake that quilt and let it relax and just gauge, is there any excess still in there or possibly have you pulled it too tight and it's pulling the quilt up and the binding looks more snug and you can just kind of gauge how much tension you need to put on that binding as you're sewing. I think different machines might require different things of you. You know how some machines really pull in some excess at the top or the bottom? You kind of need to know your machine. So that's why doing several back to back will help. You'll, it'll, it'll help you get to know how wide to make your seam allowance, how much tension to put on the binding, all that stuff. Had this quilt on the floor overnight and boy I think it picked up every thread when I picked it up this morning. And here we are back to the tag. Okay that's all the questions that we have. Oh there's more questions. Okay let's do it. Sue, does ironing the batting flatten it or does it fluff back up? Well it does fluff back up with use, but I'm trying not to iron the batting. I'm trying to just use the edge of my iron and push that off. And so the only ironing that's happening is in the last inch or so. Sylvia, good evening from Bavaria. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it. Penny, your videos are so helpful. I learned something from each one. Yay. Good. That's the point. Jana, your tutorials are always so helpful. Thank you. You are so welcome. That is my, my aim. Karen, thrilled to see you sewing your binding on the back slowly. I also sew on the back of my quilt. The tip of ironing the binding before folding is great. Cannot wait to see how you sew the front. Well, that's what's coming next. You won't have to wait long. Any more questions? Is that it? Okay. All right, I think we'll go back to the sewing machine for this next little bit. Just have to manhandle it. I didn't know how this would go doing it live because as you can imagine, I'm kind of, it's unwieldy a little bit. All right. Um, let's start with the overhead. So you can see now because I've pressed my binding, it's extending out on all sides and we are simply going to fold it over and stitch on the left side of the stitching line that exists and you'll get to see that close up. But here's a couple things we want to consider. On the top side my stitching is going to show so I want my thread to match the binding. So I'm going to change my top thread because I had just a neutral kind of stone color on it before. And on the backing I want my thread to match whatever the backing is because there's going to be a line of stitching right inside the binding. So not on the binding but on the backing. So I want my bobbin thread to match the backing. So in this case, my stone color will be fine. But if my quilt had a different backing, I would change that bobbin thread, even if it was very different from the top. I would make that bobbin thread match the back. That will make that stitching line just about disappear. So I'm going to take a moment to change my top thread to the kind of cinnamon color. And here's where I'm telling you one of my shortcuts because this is an honest show, right? This is actually 100% poly quilting thread, which I don't typically sew with, but I don't happen to have a cotton thread that's this color. So weighing my alternatives, I've chosen to use this. So it's actually a big quilting spool and I'm just going to thread it into the top of my machine. And that's going to be my needle thread. Again, I have a cheater. My machine has a self-threader, which is very handy. And the last thing I'm going to do is I've just given my bobbin a quick check, and it hardly has any thread left on it, so I'm going to put a fresh bobbin in so that 
I don't run out in the middle. Not that that would be critical. I could just put a new one in, but there will just be some overlapped stitching then, which is not my favorite. Since I noticed that, I'll change it out. Okay, we're going to start stitching. Now here, if you're not comfortable with it, you might want to pin it first. You'll see as I stitch that I just do it with my fingers as I go. But if it's giving you trouble, by all means, you know, give yourself a break. Pin it if you need to. So start anywhere, doesn't really matter where. I'm gonna start close to a corner, so we'll soon show a mitered corner. And I stitch, I do not know how well you'll be able to see this on camera. I'm stitching less than a sixteenth of an inch away from the edge, like just two or three threads away from that folded edge of the binding. And I didn't even lock stitch it because when I come all the way around the quilt, um, I will stitch over that a little bit. All right. Let's get this corner where you guys can see it. Here's how the corner is going to happen. Having this all flat and smooth down here, I'm going to put a pin about a half an inch before the corner to hold that, maybe three quarters of an inch. And then I'm going to miter my corner. So I'm going to smooth this top one down flat. Okay, I'm going to try and show you this. See there's a nice little fold there. And then I'll fold this one up and I'm just tucking any little frays or threads inside there and that gives me a mitered corner and if I need to adjust a little and I do I can just fold that a little further with my fingertip until I get a neat mitered corner and once again I'm going to put a pin in and I'm not through all the layers because I don't want it to be terribly lumpy because I want to leave that pin in there can you see it now I just want to be sure that this corner is pinned in place where that miter intersects. Okay? And then I'm going to put one more pin afterwards. And these pins are much like shifting the weight of your quilt. It's so that everything is held in place when I'm sewing this corner and nothing is pulling askew. Okay? It just helps to stabilize it. So now all that's left, quite literally, is to top stitch around that corner. So I do it slowly and carefully. I've established about where my needle is here and about where my binding, you know, extends past the presser foot here. And in my mental, you know, checklist, I'm just checking that that spacing stays as even as I can. That's what's going to give me my really even professional looking binding. And I slow right down and I stitch till I've gone right over that corner and anchored the corner. Once again, you see that I'm breaking the rules and stitching over pins. Thing number one is I use very fine pins. And thing number two is I go slowly. And I have never broken a pin or a needle doing this. So I'm not sure how you would do that corner. Otherwise, you'd probably have to find some other method like gluing to hold it. But in just a few seconds here, you'll see it feeding out the back. And it will be a nice, crisp corner. Are we able to see that on camera? Mm -hmm. There it is. Crisp mitered corner. Mm -hmm. So that's really all there is to it. And now I just continue top stitching around. And I do pace myself. Like I certainly could stitch faster. Is there anything to be gained by that? No, I'd rather have an even straight stitch then to zoom along and then possibly veer, you know, off the fold of the binding or something like that. And remember I said earlier, if you're not sure how big to make, can you see it? How big to make this seam allowance? When you're initially stitching your binding on, this is what I would do. I would stitch a chunk and then I would come around to this side and do this folding and think, now is, is that enough? Do I have enough? that I can overlap the stitching on the front, you know, and it's going to cover that stitching and enough room to top stitch and adjust my seam allowance accordingly. Because you, you do want the quilt to pretty much fill up this seam allowance, especially if you're quilting for a show or something that might be judged. They do not like to have empty binding, you know, where there's a lot of excess over there. On the other hand, it's really difficult to sew if the seam allowance is too wide and you can't fit it all in there. 
I will say, because it has happened to me before, I have at times gotten that seam allowance a bit too wide, and you can always just trim a little smidge out on the front side too, if you're having difficulty with that. So once again, I'm using my stylus wherever I need to guide and keep that seam straight. It's wanting to pull kind of into a little scallop. So I'm literally pressing the point of it into the fabric and pushing it into place where I want it to stitch. And all those little bits of effort all translate into a really even and professional looking result. As always, you get to decide how picky you are about those things, but I want to give you all the options. Taking a moment to reshuffle. And there are quite a few threads hanging out along this edge. I'm not really worrying about trimming them. I'm just tucking them all inside and stitching the whole thing down. They're not hurting anything. They're just frayed edges. So hopefully Mr. Producer is putting some nice music on for us because this will take a little bit of time. If you have any questions, chime them into the window and at uh, the chat window and at one of the corners I'll stop and we can talk about any questions you have. Okay, you guys, I've mentioned before that I put the oopses and all in these videos, so we're gonna see an oops right now. Can you see right here, does this show, Dave? Okay, do you see I did not catch that fold there with a few stitches? Okay, that's going to need to be caught. So what I'm gonna do is put a pin right there so that I can find it later, and I will come back and restitch that small area. And what that tells me is I'm cutting it a bit too close with my top stitching. I should be a little bit further away from the edge. So I'm less likely to veer off like that. Well, we should be looking at the back too. Let's have a peek here. Does that show? Can you see what it looks like from the back? So you can see the bobbin stitching is visible on the back. So that's why it's important to have the bobbin thread, I can't really. Uh, maybe I can do it mm, like this. Can you see that? So the bobbin thread does show, so it's important for that to match whatever the backing is, but it's just that single line. And I may come back and do this too. In, in my talking to you guys, in my talking to you guys, I forgot. I usually pin my label back over here while I'm top stitching it so that it doesn't get stitched down, but you know, it's not critical. Anyway, that's what it looks like on the wrong side of the quilt. So the line of stitching does show, but I feel like if it's well done and if it's in matching thread, it's not a bad thing. To me, it's worth it for the massive time savings in getting my quilts bound. And a lot of the quilts that I make personally tend to be either for giving away or for kids or college students and so that durability is a desirable quality too.
going pretty smoothly. I'm not needing to use my stylus very much at all. Which tells me I kind of hit the perfect balance for seam allowance width. So if it's a little too tight, then I really have to use that seam ripper to nudge it into place. But it's going pretty slick. And we're coming up on corner number two. All right, so I'm going to pin again before the corner. So that sets me up to have the corner exactly where I want it to be and it keeps it from pulling against me when I'm trying to shape the corner. I'm fiddling with the, the exactly where the fold line is so that I get that miter to be exactly where I want it to be. I'm going to mention another tip here, actually. Uh, let's make sure everyone can see the corner. Okay, let's take this pin out. This is another thing I learned from another quilter that has served me very well. On this side, when we were sewing it, our fold, can you see this? Our fold is going, it's on this side under that seam allowance. Okay, so on this side of the miter, so on the top edge of the quilt, I'm going to make my fold go the other way. And it's just one more way of reducing bulkiness here and evenly distributing it across the corner. Make sense? So it involves folding the reverse way from what I just showed you. But the miter holds true either way. So let's do that and see how sharp of a corner we can get. do not know if you guys can see my fingers at work or not but you will see it when I sew it I can feel the difference so now I've got it all pinned in place so on the back side the fold is pointing this way on the front side it's pointing that way that little mitered fold underneath this seam and that just makes this that much flatter when I get all the pins out we'll really see it or really notice it. I wish I could remember who over the years has told me these things. I'd love to give them credit, but you pick up little tips sometimes and I've known it for so long I don't remember where I got it anymore. My little faux table extension just works like a charm. Another idea if you don't have a way to extend your table is to lower your ironing board a little bit and put it under your left elbow. Anything that will help to hold up the weight of the quilt while you're doing these bindings will really help to make it easier for you, especially if you're working with a large quilt. Someone had asked earlier if I attach bindings on the long arm and I was explaining that yes I have but that usually means attaching them to the front right and I generally do that for clients who then go home and hand stitch them to the back so it is of course possible to attach the binding to the front wrap it round to the back and still top stitch on the front it's a bit different look so but by all means feel free to experiment with that if that's something you want to try on your long arm Generally, if I try that, because I have tried it in the past to see if it worked for me, then I do my front top stitching like a stitch in the ditch beside the binding. And on the back side, I have that binding overlap a little further so that I'm catching the lip of it with my bobbin thread. And the reason I don't love it is because it's very hard to keep it even and neat on the back. And it's all too easy to not catch that binding edge. And that was frustrating having to go back and redo so many bits. But that's just my personal take on it. But of the two methods, I, I decided I prefer this one. But now you know the rest of the story. So.
Mr. Producer is telling me I'm breathing heavy. I apologize. <laughs> I get concentrating, you know. My studio mascot, the black cat, is curled up just to the right of me on the floor. He's been here since we started. stitch fell off the binding. Let's just catch it. There we go. a few messages and comments over the last couple weeks wondering you know about my favorite tools and so I did put up a small admittedly resources page on my website with links to some of my favorite tools and where you can find them and I'll add to that as you know as they occur to me I mentioned the iron earlier um, the magnetic bars that I'm always using on the long arm things like that I hope that's helpful to have them all in one place if you're interested in knowing what they are. that didn't catch again. Tisk tisk. Let me just put a pin in it. Okay, here we come up on the corner again. So this time I will remember to do my fold in the opposite direction. So I'm just going to pin both before and after the corner. That just keeps Everything's stabilized so it's not pulling away and stretching on me when I'm trying to manipulate the corner. See how that works? Then it, it's all fixed there. It can't pull away on me. Uh, nope, other way. When in doubt, look at the other side. Then you know for sure. That's it. The beautiful thing about fabric the good and the bad thing about fabric is it has give and stretch and you can manipulate it. Sometimes that works against you because things won't stay where you put them. But in the case of these corners, it can really work for you. You can manipulate it just a thread or two to get that mitered corner just so. And then pin it. There we go. That, I believe, was corner number three.
clearly I need to move my stitching in a bit because I just dropped another one and three is just too many to drop. That tells me I am trying to stitch too close to the edge. But this is a reality show, all right. This is exactly how it looks for me. I'm push the limits and then at, at times I see oh no I've just got to make an adjustment so here's a conundrum for you guys that are watching especially those of you who have been here lots of times I was scoping around in YouTube the other day and trying to see you know how my live shows were ranking and here's a funny thing if you go to YouTube and search quilting live I do not come up at all. So, Mr. Producer is sitting here telling me, say live quilting and quilting live as many times <laughs> as you can, because we're trying to determine why on earth it does not come up if you search for live quilting. So, maybe if you guys want to put that in the comments sometimes too and say, thanks for the live quilting show, <laughs> maybe that'll help. We don't really know what we're doing in terms of you know, ranking in the Google search, but it would be really nice if people who were looking for live quilting tips could find me. period there on that I think it was on the first side that I said oh this is going really slick I picked just the right width the seam allowance but actually it looks like I have it just a hair wide because I'm I'm having to pull a fair bit and as you see it's it's wanting to pull back and that's why I keep kind of losing my grip on that little edge so you know note to self on the next one make the seam allowance just a hair narrower and it will make this job easier I want to be particularly sure that my stitching on the bottom is not veering onto the onto the um, binding itself because that would really show up if my cream colored thread veers onto the cinnamon binding on the bottom. Dave's asking me if I meant the bottom or the top. No, I meant on the bottom, on, on this side. I don't want my stitching to veer over so that, and you can hear when that happens because it's so much thicker, you could hear your needle trying to go through that. So that's part of the reason I'm staying left. I'm just staying left a little too much. It's always a balancing act. And I'm always trying to have that bottom stitching, you know, be as close to the binding as I can without actually going over it. lost it on the last stitch so I'm just gonna back up one stitch and nab it there we go
if there are other aspects of the quilt making process, particularly the quilting or the finishing, um, that you're interested in seeing on these live and unscripted episodes, I welcome your comments about that or feel free to email me info at stitchedbysusan.com um, and we'll consider that content for upcoming episodes. This way. And do we have a few comments or questions that we want to look at for a second? Okay, well, I have to look at the question first then. I'll take a sip of coffee while we wait. Do you ever use a decorative stitch to secure, secure binding to the front? I typically don't, Sue. I think you absolutely could. I'm just always about getting the quilt done at that point. <laughs> Amanda, I prefer to stitch to front, turn and blind ditch stitch from the front to, to secure the back. I don't like top stitches on the front of the quilt. Fair enough. That's, that's your style, you go for it. You know, as I mentioned that it's harder to control the back, how far of it is falling within the stitching, but if you've got that figured out, good for you, good. Penny, I struggle with the corners, but I think your method will solve my problem. Thank you. Let me know how it goes, Penny. I mean, you know my email address now, info at stitchedbysusan.com. I'd love to see pictures or tag me on social media. I'm Stitched by Susan everywhere. Facebook, Instagram, yeah, all the places. Karen, I totally agree that more quilters should watch your live videos. I put you on my other Facebook site and hope someone from there is watching. Thank you. I sure appreciate that. Joey. Funny, I do binding like you. We'll try to pin the miter corner. I use a narrow decorative stitch to avoid the oops. I've been doing the opposite fold on the corner since the 80s. See, I knew that was not a, a new tip. That's been around for a long time. And I'm, I think that is a good idea about the decorative stitch to maybe give that a try because that avoids some of the oopses if you stitch in just a little further then. So I might give that a try too. That's it. Getting these sessions with good camera angles is always a challenge. Any tips or suggestions are welcome. Absolutely. And we're always happy to hear your feedback because Dave and I are doing this on a shoestring and mostly with our cell phones and the one camera that we have now purchased. So if, but if you do have, you know, it would be easier to see, for example, what we're doing today. We debated whether to try and catch it from the front or from the back. Well, the back was easier because of all the quilt bulk. But if you have opinions about that and what would be easier to see, by all means, let us know. We're always open to hearing feedback. Corner number four, folks. Man handling my quilt. You can see my faux extension is so, so helpful right here. Otherwise, this would be the weight of the quilt would be hanging and pulling, and I'd have to be struggling to get it under the needle. So it makes all the difference. So whether it's a drawer like I have or a small table or your ironing board put at a lower height, whatever works, it's really, really worth taking the minute to set that up. It will make attaching binding so much easier. Oops, my goodness, I am struggling with this today. I don't think I've ever had so many in one quilt. I'm gonna stop and undo this one because I did it twice in a row. I 
I don't know if I've mentioned in my shows, but I, I know I have in quilting. The Drift Seam Ripper is my favorite, but even if you have your own favorite brand and it's not this one, having a sharp seam ripper is absolutely critical. It makes everything so much easier. Funny story for you guys. Okay, I call myself the queen of, fr queen of frugal and I come by it naturally. My mother, if I'm the queen, she was the empress of frugal, I don't know. Anyway, I still have two of her seam rippers from my childhood, like they never changed. That's all we used, all my growing up years. A seam ripper and a buttonhole ripper and I still have them to this day. And seriously, you have to force them to break a thread. They have no sharp left in them. <laughs> and I just keep them as this kind of reminder. You can really carry frugal to a ridiculous extreme. You need tools that work well too, and you will get a better result. So it's true of seam rippers. It's true of rotary cutter blades. It's true of your fabric scissors. You probably don't have to have the Cadillac of those tools, but having one that is is good quality and, and sharp, if that's what it's intended to be, like a seam ripper, is just really worthwhile. And the way I know, because it kind of creeps up on you gradually, right, when it's dull, I keep new ones always on hand, and every once in a while, I'll fish out a new one and use it. And if I'm feeling a vast difference between my regular and the new, time to toss the regular, go with the new. I have the same philosophy about kitchen knives. If you're a home cook and you spend quite a bit of time in your kitchen, just the difference between having a decent quality knife or spatula and working with an inferior tool is just immense. So there you go, that's my rant for the day. Any of you guys have absolutely favorite tools? for your sewing room that we should be making sure or ship shape or maybe storage tips. Let's get the hive mind together here. are nearing the end and then I will go back and fix one of those oopses so you can see it's not too threatening it would have saved me a lot of time if I had not done them though if I just got it right the first time however that is how you learn that is how you know you know how to make adjustments for the next one If you are by chance a long arm quilter um, as a business, I think it's worth getting really proficient at doing this. This is one of the services that I do offer to my clients. Um, and I charge by the inch. So, you know, way number one is to just attach it to the front for them. And way number two, or option number two, is to fully finish the binding for them. And it varies from client to client which way they want it. But I've done enough of them and gotten it speedy enough now I'm a good deal speedier when I'm not on camera. <laughs> um, that it's a legit part of my business to offer binding services. And some people really dislike that and so they appreciate having that option. Just cutting my beginning threads because we're coming up on our beginning area. One of the things that putting a bit of tension on the binding when we attached it helps with is when I first started doing this, when I was doing this top stitching part, the binding kept wanting to push away, right? And I had all this excess that I didn't know what to do with. So that making the binding a little bit tighter really helps with that. And then of course the trusty stylus is the other great tool that helps with that. Some of these things you're not even getting to see because I kind of prevent them before they happen. 
but it's it's a common annoyance when you're applying binding. Again, may be able to use a walking foot, may be able to lower the pressure on your presser foot. That might help too when you're dealing with something as thick as this is. Um, different things like that you can try that will help it feed smoothly as well. And here we are coming up on our beginning place and as you'll see there's no excess we're not going to have a fold or pleat or anything there we're just going to stitch a few stitches right over where we began and then lock stitch it and that'll be it just a few stitches in place all right so I'll go back and fix one of my oopses so you can see me do that because this is reality. I'll just do one of them and then the others will um, I'll do later off camera. But so here is this one. You can see it's about a half or three quarters of an inch. I'm not even going to undo the original stitching because the thread matches. I think it's going to be pretty unobtrusive. I'm just going to overlap by perhaps a quarter of an inch of the existing stitching that is on the binding. Lock stitch it a little bit, three or four stitches. Proceed, overlap about a quarter of an inch, lock stitch again. I'll trim all the threads and then I'll show you. So it's right here. Oh, this way, you see? It's right here, the area that I just redid. So as you can see, that's that's not gonna be obvious to anyone at all who's just getting a fresh look at this. So I'll go back and do that for all the three or four areas that I missed and put pins in. Meantime, I will get up the ironing board and kind of give you guys the bird's eye view of the whole thing. see if we can get a few corners together so you can see them I think this one's fine okay so here's a good look at it this is seeing it from the front look at uh, there we go look I have two pins right here <laughs> anyway this is the front and there's the back so it's a little slimmer from the back which I don't mind and you can see there is a line of stitching there. I don't even know that you can see that on camera, but certainly it's not obvious or aesthetically ugly. So I'm happy with that. So that's it. That is our quilt bound. Yay. So any more questions or comments before we go today? Haven't been any comments. All right. Sue, I often use decorative stitching on the front, but I use a wider binding usually. And that's completely optional. I know lots of people that do them a bit wider. Wider. I know a few people that do a two inch binding, which is really slim. Um, you have to be really particular about that. So I guess that's it for today. So once again, I am Susan Smith. You've been watching Stitched by Susan. This is a live and unscripted episode, meaning reality show, whatever project we're working on, it's in real time with all the oopses included. So if you've enjoyed the show, I invite you please to like and subscribe to the channel and we appreciate that and we will be back actually next monday already with the project because that's the first monday of september so i will see you then have a great week